You are listening to audio from Christmas of 1992. This is pulled from a VHS tape my dad took as we were opening our presents. This is the actual recording of the moment when I get the greatest gift I've ever received. As my mom just told you, I need to take a break. I am ripping through my presence like a psychopath, like a Tasmanian devil, like a fiend. I could not handle having an unwrapped present in front of me. My brother at this point had already received his Game Boy, which was amazing for the time. My sister has a talking bear that would haunt us for for years. Years. This thing would haunt us. And I'm just sitting, waiting for the fateful moment. My brother just got a micro machine. We're all excited. That's my brother. No store in New Jersey had Super Van City. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. That's my dad who's behind the camera. Billy, catch a breath. Please. No. Catch a breath. What is that? What? Catch a breath. (laughs) At this point in the video, we've everything is kind of open. We're all chilled out, looking over what we have. Until my mom and dad pull the classic Christmas story Gambit. The classic Christmas story prank. Where are the Oh, there's another present somewhere behind here you guys forgot. Now this but Jeff remembers something. We share. Share, I don't. Bobby. You Bobby to me, boy. What is it? Super Nintendo! Oh my god! Oh my god, me to share! Oh my god! Your your big present. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! That's all I can say. Oh, is my, oh god. my god! The look on my face is a complete oh surprise. Am I dreaming? I, I, I think I'm feeling ill. <laughs> Did I? Because, oh my god! No, I, this, this guy, is this a regular rental or something? <laughs> it's like a rental. Oh my god. I had these hidden so you wouldn't open them by accident. And here come the games. That's the end of them. Is this mine? I had this hidden so you wouldn't open it by accident. I think I know what these are. I think I know. I had those hidden because I don't want the boys to see them. My brother receives one. I get one. No, it's Mario Paint. I got Mario Paint. Mario Paint. Oh, right. I'm better. Oh, you got Turtles in time. And my brother got Turtles in time. I'll get you the wacky races. But I, I wish you, you could see this. Races? I and mean, you could see this. And maybe one day I'll put no. this up. This is Super Nintendo. Super Nintendo. This is an awesome, awesome game. This is Indeed. an awesome game. Indeed. Indeed, young man. Indeed. Nintendo it never gets better than this, by the way. Oh, I didn't care about the stockings. Wait, I didn't care about breakfast. Oh I didn't Stop care leaving. about Christmas. Stop I didn't leaving. care about <laughs> anything. At that moment, that Super Nintendo was life. I remember not soon after that, dashing downstairs after breakfast, my dad hooking it up to the TV, diving into Mario World until 2 in the afternoon when my parents are screaming, get ready to go to Aunt Nancy's for Christmas dinner. And just having that moment of, it'll never get better than this. Like this moment, this system, these games are the pinnacle. It's not going to get better than this. The reason I play this rather long clip before the Super Nintendo episode is because I think most, if not all, of the people I've interviewed so far for this show who have expressed a fondness or a love or for some even a devotion to the Super Nintendo, I think every single one of them can relate to that exact moment. The moment where they opened the gift or opened the box and took out that 
gray plastic piece of beauty and all of the potential it represented. On this episode of A Gamer Looks at 40, we are going to look at the Super Nintendo, the system it was, the joy it provided, and all the memories wrapped up therein. Plug in that cartridge and flick on that chonky old purple power button. Let's take a drive down memory lane with the Super Nintendo. When you decide to step up to this kind of power, this kind of challenge, this kind of flying, crashing, feeling, when you decide to get serious, there's only one place to come, the games of Super Nintendo. No one else creates this kind of experience because no one else creates these kinds of games. Now you're playing with power, super power. Hopefully my exuberance and excitement about getting a Super Nintendo was clear on that clip. But what did my brother think about it? And he was there. You know, he witnessed the reception of this amazing gift. And it was a Super Nintendo. He played games. He played Nintendo. He got a Game Boy that very same Christmas. So what did he think about it? Let's find out. What was your emotion with it, if you remember? I remember I didn't get it at all. <laughs> oh, no. Wait, what? You didn't understand I, why I was so excited? I didn't. I thought my initial, like, we already have a Nintendo. I didn't understand why it was a Super Nintendo. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I remember like it was yesterday. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I remember going, oh, well, we don't we already have a Nintendo? And you're like, no, no, but it's better. It's got better graphics. And I just... Even as a kid, I didn't comprehend the graphics were better. <laughs> like, like, cause I remember Super Mario Brothers three, and then like Super Mario World looked like Mario Brothers three to me. <laughs> so, uh, wow. I, I, I might have deflated your steam a little, but I, I think you kind of ignored me and just your, your, your excitement overcame my confusion. But it, I, kinda, I was very confused. <laughs> that's so funny. I, I remember, it, and I always say this because I do truly believe it'll be the greatest gift I ever received because it was it had no strings attached. It had no. It was just a game system for you and I. At that moment, I'm just thinking about me. Just me. No one else. Bobby, you like this? You don't care? Great. Just me. All yeah, day. yeah. And it was technically yours, I think. But, you know, we, we share everything. So, Again, yeah. exactly. There was no true ownership. Like if someone yeah, gave yeah. me a car, right? Someone gave me, here's a Lexus. I'd be like, yeah. oh, wow, that's awesome. Wait, I got to now, like, pay how much the insurance on this thing going to be? Oh, God. Yeah. You know, there's all these strings attached to everything. But yeah. just pure joy i remember that very very vividly um and for any of your younger listeners out there like what you don't what they may not understand is that like video games used to come with a game <laughs> that's <laughs> yes. when nintendo consistent companies used to be cool yeah yep. it would give you a game to at least pop in that it comes with it and super nintendo came with super mario world which is yep. that, that thing was a system seller in itself so it's that's yeah. a heck of a package um yeah, yeah, so immediately you already have a game to play and a, and a great one at that. Now, everybody I've interviewed for this show has some sort of story revolving around how they received their Super Nintendo. But Blue Williams, a regular on this program, has a very unique one that, honestly, you must listen to. Let's do so right now. Um, so this time around, uh, last time we were talking about the NES and Game Boy, we're moving up the calendar to the 16-bit era. Now, um, were you Genesis or SNES in your house? Or um, both? We, we were solidly Super Nintendo, not necessarily by choice. We did ask for both. Um, but <laughs> Wow. <That's, laughs> wait a minute. You asked for both? That's pretty daring. I mean. Yeah. But wow. – um, it, I can tell you the story of how we got our Super Nintendo. Yes, please. Okay, so it starts in the summer of 1993. There was a family in our neighborhood, across the neighborhood, and they were going out of town, probably on vacation for a week or whatever. So they promised uh, my two sisters and I $5 each if we'd come over every day and we'd water their plants and we'd pick up their mail. Okay. So I'm 12 years old. My sisters are 9 and 6. 
So we go over there on the first day, kind of trudge our way across the neighborhood, like, oh, let's just get this over with. (laughs) We walk in and like kind of I stop short because they're in their living room is like the beam of light from heaven shone down the hallelujah chorus. (laughs) They have a Super Nintendo. Wow. Now, the, the Super Nintendo had released in 91 and we and it was 93 at the time and we still didn't have one. So to see one in real life, it was like, mm. oh, my God, this is like yeah. the peak of existence. And they had, <laughs> you know, they had some football games and, and baseball games because they had boys, uh, sure. younger boys, which is why I never hung out there and didn't know that this family had a Super Nintendo. But they also had a uh, Super Mario World and Super Mario Kart. Okay. So, so that's what we did the whole week that we were over there. <laughs> we just told our parents, oh, no, we're getting the mail. We're oh, watering our plants. And then be- we, we spent every waking moment over there <laughs> playing Super Mario World and, and Mario Kart. And it was like the best week of the whole summer. And then <laughs> eventually, of course, the family has to come back. So... You know, but by then I'd seen the light. I was like, I can't go back to my pre-Super Nintendo existence, right? Right, right. So I was like, how am I going to get a Super Nintendo? So a couple days later, we're at Costco with my dad, and we pass a display of Super Nintendos. You know, this was back in the day when they didn't lock the electronics up. They just had them sitting out there on the shelf like anything else. Yep, yep. And so... um My dad is there to buy supplies for his office. You know, he's buying paper and envelopes and stamps and coffee creamer and all this kind of stuff. So he's (laughs) he's super distracted right now, right? Like he's trying to remember all the things that he has to get. And I have this great idea that I'm going to grab the Super Nintendo. I'm going to shove it under the other stuff. (laughs) And he'll just buy it and not not realize what he's done, right? Of course, because that's how that works. That's how that works. That's right. So <laughs> we get to the checkout. Of course, he notices that there's an extra $200 item <gasps> on the check. And I was like, oh, no, I'm busted. I'm doomed. <laughs> and um, but for some reason, like there was this, there was this moment where he didn't immediately get mad. Ooh, OK. And so I was like, oh, we have a chance. And so like I <laughs> smiled like my cutest smile and I like pushed like my six-year-old sister forward because she still was the sweetest one and please (laughs) papa please can we have it and he just starts laughing he doesn't get mad he just like doubles over and starts laughing and actually buys it for us wow i know so good so it worked your scheme (laughs) worked like i don't know I don't know what my long-term plan was. Like, surely if he didn't notice it, then he'd have noticed it eventually plugged into his living room and that his children were playing it. But What's this new device? <laughs> I, I... Oh, this is the same one. They just, you know, oh, y- that's you what... haven't seen it in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's not as been in, out of the closet. Yeah. That's really cool. That's sweet. I, it's funny. I'm listening to the story. I'm putting myself in your dad's shoes. If my kids did the same thing. Like if my son decided to be, you know, devious and mm-hmm. just like pull one over the old, pull one over my eyes. <laughs> I don't know what I, I'm thinking. Like, would I just get it for him? Because clearly he wants it so much. I don't think I would get mad. I don't, I wouldn't get mad. I think I would laugh and I would probably say no. <laughs> but your dad was cooler than I and said yes. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if we just caught him on the right day or what, but I'll take it. The fates were aligned. That yeah. is a really cool story. Um, back to when you were um, helping out, quote unquote, helping out <laughs> the neighbors. What did they do when they came home? Like, I almost feel like this is a a movie where like the kids are messing around. The house is a wreck and it's like 20 minutes late or 20 minutes to go and the, the, the homeowners are coming. <laughs> He's scrambling to put things away. And... <laughs> no, I think that we um, we had to go through and delete our save files. Because we didn't want to let them oh. know that we put like a thousand hours on their <laughs> games. But I mean, it was a boy's house. So, you know, we didn't run oh, around yeah. and like touch stuff. Ew. Yeah. Ew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Cool. So you spent the whole time there. That's great. Mm-hmm. Well, what an introduction and what a story. That's That's really awesome. Jeremy, also known as Ducks in Disguise on both Twitter and Twitch, tell us about his experience in receiving his Super Nintendo 
and how it was decidedly unexpected. Sure. And then <laughs> and then you got a Super Nintendo probably a little later then, I'm assuming? Yeah. So the idea was, um, I, I remember it clearly, uh, my dad was like, so... I'm going to go to the store today. I'm going to pick up a Sega CD. And we were psyched. We were like, yes, the future is here. <laughs> you compact know? Compact disc. <laughs> yeah. Compact <laughs> disc. Beautiful audio. That full motion video goodness. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. We were so psyched about it. And it came home with a Super Nintendo. And at first, we were all like, what? What? <laughs> I thought we were stepping into the future. Um, little did we know, he made the best decision yes, ever that day. <laughs> a wise man. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we got the console and just Super Mario World, what it came with. And I I pretty much memorized that game. I, I can play through it today, no problems, remembering every level. I, I absolutely love that game. We just played the heck out of that thing over and over and over again before we even started buying new games for it. Um, but that was that was really, I think, the Super Nintendo. Yes, I started with the NES, and I've always I, I loved those games. But the Super Nintendo is where where it was like video gaming is my thing. Um, I I really enjoy this now. Everything from the the wonderful platformers, the RPGs that are classics on there. I'm I'm not huge into turn based RPGs anymore, but there were some mm-hmm. good ones in the early Final Fantasy series, Earthbound, Chrono Trigger. I mean, some of the greatest <laughs> 2D classic RPGs are on the Super Nintendo. Yeah, no question. There, there's no question that the the SNES was really was the the RPG machine. I mean, right? There's so many. Great ones, you know, even like your Illusion of Gaia and Secret of Mana, and I mean the list goes on and on, right? I right. Mean, Bre- Breath of Fire series. I mean, it's insane how many classic, um, just incredible RPGs were out for that system. What? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say that in general, the all the genres are pretty well represented mm-hmm. on both those consoles on mm-hmm. on the Genesis and the Super Nintendo. <laughs> Next up, Jeff and Trevor from the New Dad Gaming Podcast share with us their memories of getting a Super Nintendo and those initial impressions. Uh, Just so you have a frame of reference, Jeff will speak first and then Trevor. Let's give it a listen. Right now, we're kind of in the middle of um, recording and interviewing about the SNES Genesis era, the 16-bit era. What was your entry point into those systems? Were you guys Genesis or SNES? Oh, myself, I was SNES all the way. I had an NES, so I was like that transition, like, you know, you can't can't go to Sonic. I need to stick with my Mario. So I was I was definitely SNES. <laughs> yeah. What about right, you, Trevor? Right there with you. It was definitely SNES. The um Yeah, Genesis was just not I don't know if it was my region or if it was a cost thing, but I just did not know many people that had a Genesis. So it was SNES all the way for myself as well. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, same here. We all kind of moved on, like you said, from Nintendo to SNES. Do you remember when you actually received your Super Nintendo? Do you remember the moment in which you received that device? <laughs> yeah, so for myself, if I would go first, the it was a collaboration between my brother and I. You know, we pooled our paper route money and got it used. I think this is probably a good at least six months, if not a full year after it first came out. So we weren't trailblazers. Mm-hmm. Um, so we <laughs> went, to, went to a little in up here in Canada where we're both from. Uh, there was a other used game store called micro play. Yes. Okay. Which, which they may still exist. And if so, it's just more like a mall kiosk at this point. But you know, you went to that beacon of used games, strolled in familiar smells, ugly people and (laughs) and lo and behold they would we finally picked up with the snes which was uh, behind the counter and dragged that thing home and just what could only be called young euphoria very nice very nice what about you jeff oh i remember it like it was yesterday (laughs) wow (laughs) It, it was such it was such a big moment in my like childhood gaming life i still remember keeping all the flyers that would come in through the mail, like the Toys R Us flyers that had Super Nintendo on sale, and I would keep them in like a pile, and they would be like dog-eared and, and rattled like, just because I was pouring through them like almost every night. And then like I saved up every single dollar I had, like so from birthday money, Christmas money, allowance, and 
And much like Trevor, it took me probably a year from launch wow. to, to finally get it. And like all my friends were starting to get it and I was so jealous. <laughs> so like eventually like saved up enough money and then we like my parents are like, all right, you have enough. We'll go into that Toys R Us. And the best part of that memory was, you know, when you ask when you ask the guy for the keys to the, the locked oh, yeah. glass door. Ooh, wow. <laughs> and oh, yes. Every other kid knew what was happening and they just looked at you <laughs> like, oh my God, it's happening. <laughs> just a slow clap. Yeah, exactly. So it was just like that, you know, that powerful moment and you walk out with that huge bag and you know what's in it and you're just walking out of the car like, yeah, I'm one of I'm one of the group. I have it finally. So that is that is emblazoned in my mind. An 80s pump up jam is playing in the background <laughs> like San Elmo, San Elmo's fire is playing back there. Just oh, I probably, had a, I probably had a mullet and everything like who knows what that hairstyle was at that time. I had a fanny pack. It was it was a different era. <laughs> That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, you had that you had that moment the big lock junk yep. oh man possibilities yep. right that's what that thing represented possibilities <laughs> next up ryan from rgb high score shares his story of acquiring his snes and the pain it required to do so so you mentioned the 16-bit era is kind of when you first kind of entered not entered into games but really cemented gaming as a piece of your life. Absolutely. Um, what was your first entry point into into the 16-bit era? So I remember this. Uh, I don't know why I remember it so well, but uh, you know, when we were young, uh, we probably picked up an NES probably in 89 or 90 the, that Christmas. Uh, mm -hmm. So we were late to the game. Of course, I was born in 1985, uh, so I was very young. Uh, at the time, I was four years old. My, it was more for my brother, uh, but I probably ended up playing it a lot more than he did. Uh, and so, one of the the interesting parts is that we we didn't get into to the Super Nintendo in ninety one when it came out. It was more probably like ninety three okay. uh, when I got access to it. And I do I remember the first time I got a chance to play it. Uh, we were in a Caldor. Uh, which I I remember Caldor. Yep, absolutely. Right. <laughs> East Coast. What's up, Caldor? <laughs> I, I think it's defunct now, if I remember it right. Is, so does they do not, not exist. Ex yep. Nope. <laughs> Caldor, Bradley's, none of those exist. Man. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there was a, a demo unit that was in, in the store itself, and there was a bunch of older kids. They were all in like, you know, big starter jackets, and they were playing, if I remember right, it was Super Mario World. Mm -hmm. And I was standing there watching them in awe. So, you know, this is like Twitch back in the day. Yep. And so uh, they were struggling with this part of the game. So I having some kind of moxie i don't know why it is that i would say that to, to kids that would clearly beat me up but i walked <laughs> over to it uh and i started doing really well with it, it i was wow. playing i was being able to, I, I was able to clear some of the levels for it and they got a little salty uh, about it <laughs> oh, uh, no. right so they had mentioned to me that that unfortunately santa was not a real thing is kind of like oh, you know? no yes yes they, so, wow that, that was my hey mom <laughs> i got a question for you oh no yeah. oh no what yeah. evil children right man kids suck they yes really, they do <laughs> they really do sometimes man that stinks so but you, just because you showed them up on some mario world um right. so it was your then your goal was like that's it that's it I am going to master this game. I'm going to take it from here. I'm oh, yeah. Kidding. For oh, sure. Well, maybe. Okay. <laughs> I was kind of joking. <laughs> As you've been hearing me preach for probably months now, being inclusive is a big part of this show. I want as many stories from many perspectives as possible, and I really want to hear from everyday people. You don't have to be a streamer. You don't have to be a blogger. You don't have to be a YouTuber. Um, you don't have to be anybody. Just be a person who's played games and had their lives changed through this medium. Um, Steve Luzader is um, just such a person. I put out a casting call on the I Watch the entire Overblood Super Replay group on Facebook. It's a mouthful. And Steve is one of the people who responded, interested in joining me on the show. So here he is talking about his Super Nintendo memories 
Um, very quick plug for Steve. He does, um, him and his wife do crafts on a site entitled All Quirks Aside. It's an online shop where they do wreaths and customized gifts and scarves and all sorts of fun stuff. So if you're into Etsy style uh, crafts, check out All Quirks Aside on Facebook. Let's listen in. What was your, were you a Genesis kid or a, a SNES kid? I was an SNES kid. And that was mostly because a guy that I knew in high school back when we, when we were friends, um, you know, he had it again. I was, sometimes I was a little behind on the systems, but it wasn't usually that terribly big of a deal because even when I was hanging out with him and we were playing on the SNES there, I got a wide experience of games. The thing was, is I don't think the SNES actually came into my household until it was rather late in the cycle i want to say uh ballpark he's somewhere about 93 94 yeah because it okay. wasn't too long before wasn't too long before we went out and got our uh our first playstation mm. um but i still got you know a wide variety you know we still rented a whole bunch of games and i read a lot of the review mags and things like that so i mean i still had a healthy dose of it though and it's still to this day probably my favorite console Justin of the Baseball and Whatever podcast shares his stories of the Super Nintendo and how it helped him connect with his family. Um, any other recollections from that kind of era? The um, even from, that, from the PC area, just kind of that. So you had a Genesis. Um, yes, in house. I grew okay. up with the Genesis. Uh, we didn't get a SNES until gosh, I want to say it was like Christmas of '99. My sister wanted a console of her own, so my parents bought her uh, a SNES mm. because they were super marked down at that point. Um, yeah. The the one thing I will say that I remember about the SNES is uh, my parents got a Super Mario World, which probably was like ten bucks at that point, but. Uh, <laughs> We we got it, and she's a couple years younger than me, and she, she's not the biggest gamer, but we literally, that that winter break, we played through all of Super Mario World, got to Star Road, and, and that is probably one of the only times I think the two of us would actually sit and play video games together, because she wow. wasn't a gamer by any stretch of the imagination, so uh, definitely, definitely, that is probably my biggest SNES memory. It seems like everybody has a story about the SNES and how they were able to get one as a kid. After the break, we talk about some of the first games we had for the Super Nintendo, some of the nuts and bolts of what made the system work, and why this incredible console was accessible to pretty much anyone. All of this after the break. Huzzah and hooray! Magecast, the long dormant video game podcast that dissects games to its very elements, has risen like a phoenix from the ashes. Join host Moses Norton, known as the well-read mage on Twitter, as he and a rotating cast of fellow soothsayers evaluate games one bit at a time. As of this recording, the Final Fantasy VII Remake episode should be live, and while I haven't heard it yet... One glance at his Twitter suggests it'll be a spicy one. Follow Moses at The Well Read Mage for audience input, alerts when new shows are released, and general chuckles. Very excited for version 2.0 of Magecast. Next up, Mike Alberton from Games My Mom Found tells us about his questionable first Super Nintendo game, talks about a classic beat em up, and shares his love for all things cheating. I want. It was after we moved. I don't know how many years after that. Um, what I, my mom had bought me a Super Nintendo at some point, and the first game she bought me was Super Ghouls and Ghosts. <laughs> Why? So, yeah, Super Ghouls and Ghosts. It didn't go well. I, I couldn't play it. I liked it because <laughs> she knew I liked that kind of thing. I liked Maybe I didn't like horror, but I liked like fantasy, and so she knew that. Sure, she saw the cover. She bought me the game, but the game was so damn hard, and I was I wasn't good at games then. I'm not really good at games now, <laughs> and I couldn't play it. And I remember she felt bad. And I want to say some point within I don't remember how long, but some point let's say within a month, she bought me Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Four: Turtles in Time. There you go, <laughs> and that's was the that, game that. Yeah. Was that more your speed, Turtles oh, yeah. in Time? Yeah. That's the game I remember playing with my dad hours and hours and hours because it's not that hard, but we still sucked at it and had to use game. I'm, I don't remember when we got Game Genie, but Game Genie was our thing when I was a kid. 
So you're okay. Well, I mean, I do know <laughs> if you if you listen to the show, you know Mike is an advocate of let's say playing it your way, play games <laughs> your way, however it makes you feel more comfortable. You do you. Uh, Mike is not shame not uh, shameful or he's shameless in his use of yeah. cheats and <laughs> emulators and anything he can do to get the game done fast. Well, these guys record at least two episodes a week, and they're two to three, two to three <laughs> episodes a week. So he's got to get through these games fast. So I understand it. And but um, that's interesting. So you had that game genie early on. I'd like to talk a bit more about game genie maybe later. Um, but Turtles in Time, a classic, right? Stone Cold classic. Uh, what do you think makes that game so good? It's easy to pick up. It's still fun to this day. It's not overly challenging like some beat em ups are. It's very mm-hmm. approachable. The colors are very bright. The characters are – everything is very lively. And you see characters that you're familiar with if you're a fan of the cartoon. But even just mm. just the way the game does it, – it holds your hand enough to keep you enjoying it but not enough to irritate you. Like another – beat him up from round from that time with like Captain Commando game where I played that was very much an arcade game and felt right. like an arcade game where it wanted to take all your quarters where Turtles in Time didn't feel like that on Super Nintendo. Yes, it wanted your money, but it didn't like it didn't beat you down like it like an arcade port would normally. No, that's interesting you send you say that cuz it is very approachable, right? Anybody can it's easy it's an easy to learn and not too hard to master if that makes sense. Yeah, it's not because the yeah, not like so many games <laughs> that come no. out for Super Nintendo no. beat-em-ups that were really hard. Yeah, most of them are pretty pretty ridiculous as far. Even, like, your final fights and such get really boring. Um, Turtles in Time never gets boring. There's not there's very few dead zones in that, that entire game. What, who is your turtle? Donatello. Ah, see? Good man, <laughs> good man. Salt of the earth. Backbone of America. I always love Donatello. When I, that's my favorite turtle to, to this day. Still, yeah, so. same. I, same. I was always into Donatello. I just like him for the reach. His his reach is uh, so choice in terms yeah, of really, time. Really good in that game. Yep. 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 Good deal. And what's your uh, what's your stage of choice? Which what's your favorite stage? Oh, I'm probably. I know the one that really always stuck with me as a kid with the prehistoric one. Yeah, well, that's when it, that's when it hits the fan because prehistoric oh, yeah. take the 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 difficulty jump to prehistoric is pretty sharp. And Slash might be one of the harder bosses in the game if you yeah, don't get the pattern down. I played the game God, about a year ago on the show, and he's he's still annoying as hell. Yeah, you're not <laughs> not great. Yeah, I've played it recently too, and oof, it t- you have to really know the pattern. But he can take a lot of damage, and or sorry, deliver a lot of damage. So <laughs> he can take Yikes. a lot too. Yep, 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 yep. Good stuff, man. And and Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Have you ever returned to that game? <laughs> Once. In high school, a friend of mine, we both decided we're going to sit down and we're going to beat it finally. Now, the catch here is we were playing this two players. One guy had the controller and he played the game. The other guy hit sh- shift F1, F1 to load, shift F1 to save, F1 to load. So we would make jumps and then I would hit the load and save button for him and we played that way. <laughs> Are you you tag team save scummed? Like, is yes, that what you really did? <laughs> only way I've ever seen the end of that game, it, it's just... I don't. I, I want to say we had controller, but actually, for the fact we might have actually had to play it with a keyboard, where he was operating the keyboard to move around, and I was hitting the save button. But I don't remember. It's been a long time, and it wasn't good. Wow, no, wow! But you saw the. <laughs> so you saw you went through lengths to get through that game. Wow! It took why us don't a you while just too. why don't you just plug in the old Game Genie and, and shit our codes? There weren't Game Genie codes for that game that worked, if I remember correctly. Next up, Lou Williams and I show some love and spend some time gushing about one of the greatest platformers ever made. I, you've been on, I believe you've been on record as saying that you're a huge, huge Mario World fan. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I think it might be your favorite Mario game without well, putting words in your mouth. I'm going to say that Mario 3 is my favorite. Oh, that's right. I'm I'm confused. Mario three is your favorite, yes. Yes, Sorry. but no, it's you know Mario World is it's right up there. It's like not even second. It's like favorite and a half. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> favorite uh, one point five zero. Yeah. What about Mario World? Do you think just really clicks with you? Well, it's a phenomenal game. It's a phenomenal game design. First off, everybody knows that, and then. Um, I love progressing through the different areas. I love that it it was designed no matter what age you are, you could go in and and find something and, and be able to play whether you wanted more of a challenge or you just wanted to 
just get through the levels. Like I, I mentioned playing with my sisters who were nine and six and I was 12. And, you know, it was a game that we could all play. There weren't a lot of games that all of us could play. Like my, my littlest sister, she had a Sesame Street game that she liked. And I was like, oh, you're killing me. <laughs> so it, it was nice to, to have just one game for everybody. It was truly mm. an all ages game. Yeah, that, that's really a really good point. It's very accessible. Like mm-hmm. it's it's very everybody can can kind of and it's got enough challenge for everybody as well. You know, like even if you get to the later levels, the, Mario World's not a not a cakewalk game. Like it's got some challenging stuff in there, um, but it, there is enough. I think I don't want to say hand holding, but it is definitely enough to, uh, assist to for anybody really to get through if they really try yeah. to persevere. And it's difficult, but it's still fair. It's not like a lot of games of that era where they just, you know, made a super difficult, super unfair game. So you have to play it forever just to get past the first level. And then they called that, you know, a game with replayability. That's not what Super Mario World is. It's extremely fair. So Mm. even if you're a young kid, you can still play and practice and beat the game. Yeah, no, that's that's a really great point. You can still... Still get through it, you know. Mm-hmm. I would say probably more so, maybe more so than Mario Three. I, th- I would say Mario World's probably a little more forgiving. Um, yeah, I'd but again, agree I with think that. That's, yeah, I, but that's just kind of the evolution of the series. I think it's mm-hmm. not like nowadays where you know if you fail five times, they just <laughs> let you through. Like, <laughs> or, yeah, you. I, what is it on uh, Mario Maker Two? I think if you died three times in a row, then the Luigi pops up. Hey, you want some help? It's like, yeah. no, <laughs> no, I don't. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not 10 i'm I a 40 year old man I am, I can, i'm trying to up. win i'm trying to win damn it please <laughs> please stop reminding me of my failures yeah next up steve luzader talks about that really important but sometimes underappreciated piece of plastic you hold in your hands that really important part of playing games. And then after that, Greg from the Level Zero podcast shows some love to the SNES sound chip. First time you have an SNES controller when you're upgrading from the NES, mm. you're 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 worried for a second. Like oh yeah. It looks like it should feel good. And it's and it does, but you're worried like, like shoulder buttons, you got an X and Y button. I mean, how is this all gonna work? And after a few moments of any game, you're like, I'm not missing a beat this is how games are supposed to be done. And it's probably not a coincidence that ever since then, just about every system, every controller has gone to this pad, four button, mm-hmm. shoulders. They've all used that staple in some way or another. And then the other so that thing was that, a, yeah, that the Super Nintendo had was was the graphic was the sound chip, which was mm-hmm. very much the cutting edge of anything that had come before it or after it in terms of what you could do in a game with sound um, and and man, did they make use of it at Nintendo. And then the interesting part, yeah. and this is something that I've gone into on my show and I had no idea until I just said, Oh, I don't know. I'll do the research of, you know, the Nintendo and PlayStation and Xbox. I learned immediately that it was uh, Ken Kutaragi, the founder and father of the PlayStation that actually designed the sound chip and the super Nintendo first. Huh? Interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. There's a whole delineage of, and if you ever look up Ken Kutaragi, he's one of the most interesting people. He's very much like the Steve Jobs, but of the video game world um, and how he pioneered that and then pushed into the relationship with Nintendo. And really, he's the one that made Sony even interested in video games at all. And it was just because he was enamored with his kid playing tennis on the NES. And he was like, hey, I think I can do better than that. And so by himself in his like, you know, a little apartment, he soldered together the sound chip and like did it without Sony's permission, without the executive's permission, made wow. the partnership with Nintendo. And then he, he designed that sound chip and then eventually got Sony's blessing. And then that went down the whole road of the whole saga between the SNES CD and then the oh, yeah. N- Nintendo PlayStation, that whole thing. So yikes. Yeah. yeah. Imagine, imagine if that were, if that were different, right. If that, if that all that had landed in a different way, it really could have. And it's, but it's Oof. amazing that the founder of the PlayStation is the one that helped put Nintendo on the map into a new generation with new technology. Gotcha. That's yeah. great. That's really interesting. This any SNES sound is, th- that is something that's kind of a subjective. Um, some people prefer the Genesis 
chip tuny sound. Some people prefer the SNES, which is a rounder, kind of a fuller mm-hmm. sound. And mm-hmm. of course, it's about how you utilize it, right? I mean, right. I think there are some soundtracks on the Genesis that are phenomenal, and I think there are some soundtracks on the SNES that are exceptional as well. Um, I think I lean a little more towards the Genesis side, even though I am Team Nintendo really? and the Bit Wars. A little what bit. makes you say that? I just like chip tune. I like I like that chip tuny, that like a har- little harsher. I understand it's, yeah. it's a little harsher, Tinny. but it's got mm-hmm. a little more a little more nuance to it. A lot of a lot of games on the SNES um, sound a little mushy, but if you can utilize that chip properly, it is yeah. gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Like, there's yeah, nothing there were, like it. There were definitely composers that figured out how to make the most of it, but man, it's hard to argue with the with the Sonic. Um, theme songs yeah. and just the, the whole soundtrack of Sonic. It's really hard to argue with how catchy and perfect it sounds for what that system could do. And finally, Blue and I talk one more time about the Super Nintendo and really the heart of it and why it took off in such a major way. The fact that anybody and everybody could play it. Anything else uh, on the SNES that really kind of struck you when you were a kid playing it? Um, I guess just that if, if when I think back on the SNES, I feel like this is where I came into my own as a gamer. Mm. I was a little bit older, like I said, 12, when we finally got one. And I think that with the NES, while I loved it, I feel like the games were just so hard. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot yep. of people say like, oh, you just got to get good, especially when you're a kid. When you're a kid, you're good at games because you can just play all day. But it was never like that for me. I just the games were fun, but I've always kind of walked away from the NES feeling beat up. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the, <laughs> the yeah. SNES, I feel like had more that was there for me. Like it recognized who I was as a gamer and was ready to meet me there. That's a really, really interesting point because I think the games are maturing. You mm-hmm. know, they were, because you know, as we all know, games started out in the arcades, and in the arcades, it's all about stealing your money. Yep. And and the SNES has some of that too because the fighting games and and um, your final fights and things like that. There were some quarter munchers as well, but that really was the whole point of the arcade game. So when the home consoles came out, they were still in that mode, right? Really hard. Right. We can't release a game that has 35 minutes of content. We need to pad this out. How do we do that? Difficulty. Yeah, make just it make more it challenging. Hard. And, and make it hard. You know, I played so many games that are just hard as all get out. Like I, uh, Lion King, everybody says is notoriously hard, but sure. I can beat that with my eyes closed now because I just played it so much. Right. And, uh, you know, the Super Star Wars games. I cannot beat those now. I lost my touch at those. But once upon a day, I did beat them. I loved them so much. So the games were still plenty hard. It's not a question of the games being dumbed down. But I think it is just a question of where's that line between challenge and just straight up brutality? We're going to take your money. Yeah. I mean, that's really – and I think that's the the 16-bit era definitely started changing that just changing that mentality to we want to make a game that is completable, that does have a beginning, middle, and end, and and can have some sort of, not that not a narrative, but just have a, a playthrough, if uh-huh. that kind of makes sense. And we haven't even scratched the surface. Next week, we focus on games. Dozens and dozens of games. From the all-time classics to the obscure and strange, we have the entire spectrum covered. I'm thinking at least one episode, but maybe two. I mean, should Donkey Kong Country have its own episode? Maybe, based on the conversations I've had. Should Super Metro get its own show? Possibly. Should we dedicate an entire episode to the SNES RPGs? Yeah, that's almost guaranteed. All from a square gray box that yellowed with age, but not in our hearts. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of A Gamer Looks at 40. If you enjoy the show, please, please, please follow me on Twitter at A Gamer Looks at 440. If you have a story for the show, we will be going through the entire length and breadth of the history of video games. So if you have a connection, I'd love to hear it. 
a gamer looks at 440 at gmail.com. And as always, like, share, subscribe, tell a friend, write a review. All of that helps grow the show immensely. And as always, I'm Bill Tucker. Thanks for listening. <laughs>